What is up guys? Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be part four of my four part series on photography and classism. If you missed the first three parts, you can go and check them out on my channel and they're linked in the description below. You don't have to have seen the previous three videos to watch this one and you don't have to be a photographer to get value out of watching this series. For those of you who have committed to watching all four parts of this series, I wanna thank you very much <laughs> for sticking with me on this one. I know it's been a lot but I really appreciate you guys. I appreciate all the likes and comments and subscriptions, but I also appreciate that you're taking the time to critically engage with this topic. I think I've said enough in my intro. I do wanna jump right into it because this video is going to be very long. <laughs> the script is like 20 pages long. Hopefully we can cut some of that out in post, but without further ado, let's jump right in and we will get started. Entry one of tier eight. Photography is rooted in aristocracy. So let's compare photography to other art forms, particularly song and dance. Now, these are forms of art that use elements that most people are born with. They use your body and your voice. And there's no paywall to get started. You can do these things as a beginner, as soon as you can walk and talk, pretty much. Because of this, they are ancient art forms. And they're sort of ingrained in our experience as human beings, right? A lot of us are born with this natural desire to sing or to move our bodies around or to beat on things, to create a rhythm. There are conventions in song and dance, yes, but those conventions differ across cultures and landscapes and can look and sound very different depending on where and when the art is being performed. This is part of what makes those art forms so beautiful, right? They're like a liquid, taking on the shape of whatever vessel is used to create them the culture, context, body, voice of the artist, all coloring the resulting expression. There have been attempts made, typically by aristocratic white Europeans, to homogenize these conventions and create rules for what constitutes good song and good dance. And as a result, we have particular disciplines of song and dance that are exclusive, with artificially imposed class barriers to keep undesirable artists out. But these imposed conventions are just that. They are walls erected artificially around a universally accessible discipline, and they're completely unable to encompass the entire body of art in their rigidity. Not all dance is as punishing as ballet, and not all music is as precise as classical. And while there will always be weird, kind of racist nerds who insist that classical music is the height of the art, they will always be outnumbered by people who get enjoyment out of listening to and creating music in other genres, at other skill levels, and with different conventions. And when we look at who makes the biggest contributions, revolutions in the art, introductions of new genres, and systems of expression through song and dance, we don't just see a handful of white European guys. Music, in its modern iteration, has kind of developed despite their intervention hasn't it? Here's a few of the highest paid musicians of our time. And as you can see, it's a bit different than this collage of the highest paid photographers. Now, let's look at photography. Photography is kind of the opposite of all that. It's neither ancient nor natural nor accessible to everyone. Photography was invented in Europe in the 1800s and pioneered by the same white European aristocrats who were then endeavoring to install class barriers in other forms of art. It did not come about from a desire to express oneself more robustly, to sing, to move one's body, to create art. No, photography resulted from the technological pursuits of European nobility and its use as an art form was kind of an accident. The camera was not invented as an artist's tool. It was an expensive documentary technology used to capture scenes and people with utmost fidelity. It was a way to replace artists, particularly in portraiture. <laughs> Photography was invented at the height of colonialism, at a time when white European scholars were using advancements in technology to prove themselves superior, a time when slavery in the American South was reaching its peak and when working conditions, even for free people, were often deadly and working class citizens were thought of as disposable cogs in the blooming industrial capitalist system. Photography was used as a tool of imperialism, a method of documenting and thereby inscribing on history the subjugation of colonized peoples. We know photography to be a powerful tool for shaping narratives, but imagine that tool is available only to the wealthy elite. Imagine the power that tool would have in naturalizing their preferred narrative. I mean, it's probably not hard to imagine because, well. And consider this, the photograph is printed on literal silver. Like, <laughs> Seriously, what a joke. At a time when class disparities were as profound as they are today, imagine a technology being invented that literally burns up silver plates. Silver, by the way, was still being used as a currency in a lot of the world at this time. So imagine yourself 
a worker in that system, toiling away at your 16 hour a day job before the labor movement was even a joke in the tabloids, and imagine hearing that the ultra rich are now spending their time burning images of themselves into pure silver out of an academic interest in replacing painted portraits. Like, man, if, if I was born then, I would have some pretty different ideas about photography, I can tell you that. Like, I would think that's the dumbest shit I ever heard. But it's true, right? And at the dawn of the art, and for many decades following, the photographer was basically a wealthy guy with a lot of time and money on his hands who could afford to buy all of the equipment and then mess around with it until he got it right, which would have been a very expensive process when you're literally burning currency. And we think, oh, well, photography has come a long way since then, right? A lot has changed since 1850, and yeah, for sure, but there's a lot that hasn't changed too, right? There's a lot of legacies left over from that colonial industrial era that don't just shake out of modern culture all that easily. And a few legacies that are so embedded in our culture that leaving them in the past is going to take a whole lot more than just getting over it. So all this to say that photography is an extremely young art form, born and raised by 19th century European aristocrats who were just the worst. And that foundation absolutely colors the conventions of photography today. Who has made the biggest contributions to photography in the last century or so that it's been considered an art? Hmm, <laughs> would you look at that? All of this buy your way through the iceberg stuff, even starting at the very tip where you need to buy a camera because the more accessible phone camera doesn't count. Well, all of this is continuing photography's legacy, a legacy that's been going strong since the very first photograph was burned into bitumen from the windowsill of a French estate home in 1827. And so, with all that said, I am gonna jump into tier nine. I'm gonna skip the last entry on tier eight because I'm not as excited about talking about it as I was when I wrote The Iceberg. And I only wanna talk about stuff that I'm excited about. So here we go, tier nine, entry number one. Photography enables and perpetuates capitalist consumption. This is one of my least favorite entries on this entire iceberg. And it pops into my mind every now and then, and I wish I could just buff it out of my brain wrinkles so I didn't have to think about it. But now you're gonna have to think about it, so you're welcome. When I said in my last video that there's something extra special about photography that makes it more vital in perpetuating the capitalist system than any other form of art, this is the concept I was referencing. Capitalism requires consumption, and photography drives that consumption. Okay, hear me out, hear me out. So capitalism is about producing goods, right? and then selling them for profit to consumers. Now, ideally, it's about producing goods that fulfill needs, which consumers will then buy in order to satisfy those needs. And people who love capitalism love that it has this ability to produce needed goods. Although it's the workers producing the goods, isn't it? The capitalists are just selling them for more than they're worth in order to create a profit. So it seems like we should probably cut them out of the equation if it was really about meeting needs, but what do I know? I just take pictures. Not all goods are needed, in fact, most aren't. But unfortunately for the capitalists, there's a finite amount of profit that can be made from fulfilling real human needs. So in order to make more profit, you need to make more needs. Now, there is a difference between needs and wants, but that difference is pretty blurry under capitalism, and we don't tend to make that distinction in our spending habits. So I'm just gonna use one word to mean both things. I'm not gonna trouble myself with the distinction here. Making more needs involves changing the perception of consumers to make them believe that they need particular goods or services. In comes advertising. What is advertising all about? It is about showing consumers how your product will satisfy their needs. And in many cases, it's about fabricating problems that this product will solve. A good ad basically shows you the product and then it shows you how your life would improve if you owned the product. There's different tactics, but this is the essential formula. But the catch is this. In order to know that you want something, you have to see it. Of course, there's exceptions for actual natural human needs like healthcare, but for the most part, you do have to see something to know you want it. And that's the crux of it. There's a few ways to see something, in person, in a drawing or likeness, in a video, and in a photo. And of course, photos and videos are the two easiest ways to show people an item, and that's why they are the two dominant forms of media that we're exposed to online. It's all photo and video. So photography, and therefore the photographer, plays a pivotal role in advertising and therefore in driving consumption. Every photo you have ever seen in an advertisement was taken by somebody working as a photographer. Every billboard, every banner ad, every magazine spread, every sponsored Instagram post, 
all were made possible by photographers. And a lot of these ads have pretty toxic effects on our culture, don't they? The process of creating needs in order to sell products requires pointing out deficits that that product will solve. And in many cases, that involves preying on people's insecurities. You need to lose weight to fix your acne, to whiten your teeth, to shave your body hair, to keep your head hair long and shiny and your eyelashes thick and dark. You need to keep up with your neighbor and with society and the people around you in every regard. And these are all things that advertisers have told us in order to sell product. They set these unattainable standards and then engage in advertising campaigns that very effectively pass these standards off as normal. And all of that advertising requires photography. I'm not saying that photographers are responsible for the toxicity created in our culture by advertising. The insecurity, self-doubt, comparison to others, and the many other human feelings that advertisers prey on and exacerbate with their campaigns. But there is a photographer involved in every single one of those campaigns. Isn't that fun? I can't think of any other art form that is more necessary in capitalism than photography. I bet you didn't think of that when you bought your first camera, hey? <laughs> in last week's video, I talked about how aspirational success stories by famous artists are a key component in capitalism. How these stories represent an escape from capitalism through artistic achievement, and tell us that we too can escape this way if we're willing to work hard enough. This in turn keeps us motivated to work harder for longer hours with greater intensity, thereby feeding the capitalist machine with our labor and perpetuating the system that exploits us. Basically, the harder all of us work trying to escape capitalism, the more powerful the system gets through our labor and consumption. That has a pretty dark connotation when our labor is specifically driving advertising, right? Because as photographers, when we work harder, take on corporate gigs and e-commerce and advertising clients of any kind, we are directly contributing to consumerism, more so than any other kind of artist. When I do outreach to new clients, I am basically trying to convince them to advertise their product. A big part of my pitch is talking about the value of high quality photography in building up their brand. And if they take me up on it, then I am responsible for one more advertisement out there telling people they need something. And if my client then pays to promote that advertisement on Instagram or some other platform, then that's one more drop in the coffers of mega corporations like Google and Facebook. In a way, that drop in those coffers is the essential product of my job. That is the utility of my labor in capitalism. I am my own boss. I don't have any managers or board members or shareholders siphoning my wages from me at the top of a corporate hierarchy. I work entirely for myself and I keep every penny of my labor after taxes. And yet, my work has utility in perpetuating the capitalist system nonetheless. So don't get me wrong, right? I love my job. I love my job. I love creating beautiful images. I love helping small businesses build their brands and showcase their wares. I love photographing extravagant outfits and opulent couture. And I love handling desirable objects and delicate textiles. And no amount of capitalist guilt is gonna stop me from doing that. I'm not trying to shame you for being a photographer. I am a photographer and I will continue to be a photographer for as long as I possibly can. I should remind you that every job in this system, every way of making money reinforces the system to some extent. My intention is not to convince you to switch jobs. But I do think that it is valuable to talk about the unique ways in which this job, photography, intersects with capitalism. And I'll say it once again, I don't think that you need to have solutions to problems to make those problems worth talking about. And come on, tell me this wasn't worth talking about. Like, it's pretty fascinating, right? Even though it's terrible. Oh, okay, so we have strayed from the topic of classism a little bit, so I've got a bit written to help tie all these concepts together. <laughs> so what divides social classes? Income disparity. Here's what income disparity looks like in the US right now. Oof. So there's the capitalist class, the one who owns the means of producing goods, and then there's the working class, the ones who make those goods. The capitalists are the ones with all the money. And how did they make that money? Well, they used their existing money to exploit flaws in the global economic system, but also <laughs> by selling product. And how did they sell it to consumers? Through vast and sophisticated propagandistic advertising campaigns over the last century and a half, among other politically nefarious activities. And so photography is necessary in advertising, and advertising is necessary in widening the disparities between social classes, and that class disparity is fundamental in capitalism. I don't know if that was a messy explanation or not. Basically, photography plays a role in creating and reinforcing class structure by showing you what you want and motivating you to work hard to get it thereby feeding the profits of the capitalist class through both your labor and your consumption and widening the gap in the process between them and us. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Let's move on to tier 10. Oh my God, I am so ready to be done with this iceberg. I never want to think about classism again. Tier 10. Oh 
Ivan, but capitalism is so good. Look at all of the things we have because of capitalism. Your camera was only made possible because of capitalism. Yeah, but look at the people who make the things we enjoy because of capitalism. <laughs> Clearly, it isn't working for them. This is the section of the iceberg where we talk about class on a global scale, and how some countries and people benefit from the subjugation and exploitation of others. We have cameras because Central Africa has cobalt mining child slaves, and just because you don't see them doesn't mean they aren't there. The creation of our art, the tools of our trade, are made possible by the exploitation of others. We are not responsible for that exploitation, but we are complicit in it. And before we get into this, I don't want to hear any no ethical consumption under capitalisms in the comment section, okay? I know, <laughs> I'm not gonna give up photography either. But just because there's no ethical consumption doesn't mean that we shouldn't be informed about the ways that our consumption is unethical. I feel like a lot of the time that I hear no ethical consumption under capitalism, it is said as a way to avoid thinking about unethical practices and brushing them off as like, you don't have to tell me, I assume that I already know. That's a bit of a head in the sand approach, isn't it? I think it's responsible to take an interest in the origins of the tools we use. As artists especially, because our labor is so often taken for granted. And isn't it ironic to take the labor of others for granted simply because we'd rather not think about the horrors of globalization and late-stage capitalism? You've come this far, <laughs> you've watched like almost two hours of classism content at this point, you have to think about it. I'm gonna show my hand here a little bit before I get into this section. I have this great book called Capitalism and the Camera, which I totally bought legally and absolutely didn't print off of my office computer back when I had a real job. Now, this book is dense. Like, so dense that it felt like I was doing more deciphering than reading as I was getting through it. But there's a lot of great food for thought in here if you have the stamina to find it. I guess it didn't help that I printed it out on six point font. <laughs> I mean, uh that the publishers printed it out on six point font. This book is a series of academic essays, and the first section is a collection of essays relating to photography's imperialist, colonialist past. There's this one essay called Mining the History of Photography by the world's most Irish sounding person, <laughs> Siobhan Angus, and it really got my little photographer brain up and running. So this essay is what inspired both entries on this final tier, where we are going to talk about how photography as an art not just the career aspects, but all photography, all image making, perpetuates exploitation. Tier 10, entry 1, silver mining. Photographic film is made out of silver halide particles. Basically, it's silver fused with one of the halogens. All film, yes, even color film, is made of silver halide particles. And so, all film photography requires silver to be mined from the earth. The history of silver is pretty brutal, especially in the early days. Between 1500 and 1800, Bolivia, Peru, and Mexico accounted for 85% of the world's silver production, and all of these regions would fall under Spanish colonial control. The extraction of silver from Central and later South America essentially funded the Spanish colonial apparatus, enabling imperialist expansion into 35 countries around the world. And of course, it wasn't all good, hardworking Spanish pilgrims mining this silver. It was the enslaved indigenous populations of these countries. And once their numbers had plummeted due to disease, overwork, and the general trappings of genocide, European colonists then imported new slaves from Africa and worked them all to death too. So where was all that silver going? Where was it being used? Not photography, <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> not at first. But the invention of photography, a technology which literally burns through silver, was made possible by the abundance of silver available in Europe, a supply which was made possible in turn by the discovery and extraction of silver in the New World. And actually, photography uses a lot of silver, like a lot more than you'd think. By the first decade of the 20th century, Eastman Kodak Company was using one ton of silver bullion per week, making it the largest consumer of silver in the US outside of the US Mint. To compensate this demand, Eastman Kodak actually purchased its own silver mine in Ontario, Canada. Despite this mine purchase, the majority of silver used in Kodak's manufacturing actually came from the Cerro Gordo mines in California, which first became operational in 1865. Of course, the area had to be completely cleared of its indigenous populations before mining operations could begin, so naturally they just asked the indigenous people really nicely to go somewhere else. Right? <laughs> That's how that happens. Once the mine was up and running, 
Who was mining it? Well, it was Chinese laborers who immigrated to the United States between 1850 and 1860 to work in the gold rush and the railroad. And these folks were treated as second-class citizens, often made to work in extremely unsafe conditions. At one point, a mine collapsed in Cerro Gordo and killed 35 Chinese laborers who had been made to work in an extremely unstable part of the mine, and their bodies were never recovered. So that's Kodak's main mine in the early days of photography and the silver that many beloved loved historical photographs are burned into. Later on, the demand for silver exhausted that mine and Kodak moved on to other sources. At the height of film photography's popularity in the mass market, roughly 60% of global silver supply was used in the photographic industry. Isn't that crazy? Like 60% of all silver was going to make photos. It's hard to find info on where Kodak was sourcing its silver at this point, and it's even harder to find info on where the silver comes from today. So in the absence of specifics, let's look at global silver production. The world's leading producer of silver is Mexico, but most of the mining operations in Mexico are owned by American and Canadian firms. These operations are controversial, as locals have pointed out that foreign companies do not respect Mexican laws regarding environment and workers' rights. And indeed, these companies are pretty much in league with the cartels. Rob McEwen of McEwen Mining Incorporated has publicly stated that his company has a good relationship with the cartels. <laughs> Way to say the quiet part out loud, Rob. As for environmental damages, Canadian mining firms are terrible. Like, there's been a ton of spills and contamination events from silver mines in Mexico that the firms will just pay to have swept under the table instead of paying to have them cleaned up. Meanwhile, groundwater is unusable and the soil is leaden with toxic materials. So think of that, I guess, next time you load your roll of gold 200 into a point and shoot. <laughs> Anyways, I think talking about how terrible Canadian mining companies in league with the cartels are in Mexico is a great segue into talking about how terrible Canadian mining companies in league with the cartels are in Central Africa. Which brings me to tier 10, entry number 2, cobalt extraction. So, maybe for that section on silver you were thinking, well I only shoot digital so I'm good, right? Wrong. Silver is also a necessary component in digital devices as it's used in printed circuit boards. But you know what else is necessary for digital devices? Cobalt. It is used in batteries, first and foremost, but it also plays a role in recording technologies like memory cards and hard drives. So the battery on your camera, the memory card that you take your photos on, the laptop that you edit those photos with, and the hard drive where you store them, all of those devices use cobalt. And where does cobalt come from? Well, mostly from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's not very democratic, actually. Which is currently in the grips of one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time. Now, the DRC has more cobalt reserves than the entire rest of the planet combined. And modern technology requires them to be mined. But how does that mining happen? The cheapest way is to just throw human death and suffering at them until the veins run dry. But legally, large industrial internationally owned mining companies can't knowingly put their employees at risk by tossing them into unsafe working conditions and paying them pennies a day. So instead, they buy the cobalt off of freelance miners who scrape the mineral out of the earth in giant pit mines that surround the large scale industrial mines. Now, there are a lot of factors that might convince somebody to jump in a pit mine and spend their days scraping at the earth while inhaling toxic cobalt dust. But extreme poverty brought by genocide, government corruption, and a landscape ravaged by ever-warring militia groups is certainly a pretty compelling reason. So compelling, in fact, that this pit mining activity is often referred to as modern-day slavery because the workers are paid so little and have such a life-and-death obligation to continue mining that it is completely inescapable. Not to mention that in many cases, the aforementioned warring militia groups are actively compelling workers to keep mining by way of armed supervision, which is literally slavery, like no doubt about it. Oh, and also a lot of these laborers are actually children that have been abducted from their families by these militia groups and made to work. And the money that they earn from the cobalt they mine then goes to fund those militia groups, thus perpetuating the cycle. So now you might be thinking, how are these internationally owned mining companies responsible for this? Because you know they are. Well, for one thing, they buy the cobalt off of the freelance pit miners. But they also pay off corrupt government officials to allow them to skirt environmental and humanitarian regulations. And they've bought the mining rights to these deposits from those corrupt officials. <laughs> essentially paying a handful of people for the right to deprive millions of people of their wealth. Ain't that just colonialism again? The DRC has enough mineral deposits to be one of the wealthiest countries in the entire world, and yet here it is, one of the poorest and most exploited. 
And these giant mining corporations have an interest in maintaining the system that they are exploiting, right? They don't want the DRC to have a democratic government or adequate wage protections or a robust social safety net because then they wouldn't be able to decimate the environment and profit off of slave labor. And that wouldn't be very good for business, would it? They want the armed militia groups to continue terrorizing the country because paying a handful of people to keep tens of thousands of slaves at work is a lot cheaper than paying those tens of thousands of people a fair price for their labor. Canadian mining companies are not 100% responsible for the humanitarian crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but they are absolutely doing their best to prolong it. And it's weird that so many of these mining companies are Canadian, right? Like, I feel like Canada has such a small impact in so many other industries, and then in mining, it's just like taking over the world. I didn't really look into why for this video, it was sort of beyond the scope of my research. I was setting out to <laughs> write a video about photography and here I am Googling why American investors prefer Canadian mining firms. But actually, I think I've said enough on this topic for you to get the point. I think that's enough to wrap up tier 10. And I am sorry for the picture that this last installment in this series paints. You know, part three, we got kind of intense towards the end and here in part four, I'm just dumping on photography. <laughs> the entire runtime. We knew things would get pretty dark by the end of this iceberg, right? That's kind of the point. We're in that deep, dark, abyssal pit beneath the iceberg where all of these concepts that we hate to think about exist. I think that once in a while, it is healthy to dredge it all up and face it head on. I wanna thank you guys for sticking with me through this series. It's the most work I've ever put into something on this channel and I'm really glad that I took the time to do it. A lot of these concepts are things that I've been thinking about for a long time that have been sort of haunting me and being able to express them and talk about them on this platform is fulfilling for me. If you like this video, you can like it, comment, share it, all of that. Do share it, that would be fantastic. Going forward, I am going to have a critical think about the aspects of this art and this job that I love and maybe shift some priorities around. Write out new goals for myself that are as detached from the capitalist paradigm of productivity as possible. There have been a lot of great comments on these videos about the value of breaking free of that hamster wheel of content creation that has enveloped photography. And so I'm happy to see that so many of the folks watching these videos are on the right paths if not physically, at least emotionally. It is going to be a while before I talk about anything this intense on my channel again. It takes a lot of work, both mental and emotional, to get through these topics. I really wanna focus on some videos that aren't depressing <laughs> for a while. I think I'll probably make some light, fun videos over the next few weeks, so stay tuned for those. If you liked this deep dive series and you're looking for more of my videos that have a similar deep dive vibe, but maybe aren't so depressing, you can go and check out this video, which is Photography Tropes in Horror. I love this video. I think it's one of the best ones I've made. And there's also this one about the Capture Photography Festival that I think deserves a lot more love. I really like this video. I watch it myself occasionally. So go check that out if you're looking for more to watch. Thank you guys all for watching. Thank you for engaging with this kind of content, with this series. I really appreciate it. I'll see you guys next week with a much more lighthearted video. And in the meantime, I want you guys to stay sharp and don't forget to keep shooting. Bye guys.